met Jose Leal a long time ago. We were chatting about motivation and why people do what they do. It's a good question because here we are in a place and time when fear seems to be the primary motivation. And yet I'm starting to see a nice move through fear, which is what can we do better and how can we be better in and for the world? You're listening to the Insight to Action Inspirational Insights podcast. My name is Donna Jones, and my hope is that by listening to these conversations and this one in particular, that you will be supported and inspired to take a bigger step in life and to be completely in alignment with who you are and why you're here. Let me start with it by introducing Jose. He's founded or co-founded six companies and has done a lovely, successful exit. He's also been involved, heavily involved in the industry. And then he moved into finding Radical Purpose, a co-owned and co-managed organization that's helping people create organizations that meet their needs. If ever there were a time for that, now is it. Jose, tell us about Radical Purpose, please. Thank you for having me, Donna. Uh, Radical Purpose. Radical Purpose is an interesting concept. The reason we use the term radical is to describe the root of something. Radical has the two meanings. We've got the meaning of root and the meaning of fundamental change, right? And we're so used to the fundamental change that we forget that really the initial meaning was about the root. The root of human behavior is motivation. And the root of work is human motivation. So we can't talk about work without talking about motivation. That's really the understanding. You talked about my exit. Um, That led me to work in a corporate. And that corporate was 10 years of learning how not to work. It's what led me to try to understand why I had done what I had done within the corporate world and to discover this understanding of human motivation as a radical purpose. We have essentially two traditions. We have the tradition of the religious and spiritual understanding of us having a purpose in life. And we have different ways of describing that. And then we have this scientific tradition of describing life as this fragmented purposelessness way of seeing the world. And what we've realized is that over the last 30 years or so, neuroscience has really brought those two things together. There is a purpose and that purpose is scientific in nature, but it does provide us with an understanding of our motivation. And so that's really the work that we've been doing over the last eight years or so is developing a clear understanding of how motivation He is tied to our behavior and how we can tap that understanding of our radical purpose. Intriguing. With the beginning of the COVID thing, everybody ran out and bought toilet paper. And I thought, wow, that's a fascinating thing to do. (laughs) So that was the one part of it. And now we're seeing in some countries, in some nations, a retraction immediate gut reaction was to bring everything down to certain, get back to normal, as opposed to growing and moving to a much more advanced level of functionality. Now we're watching a lot of young people just say, look, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing the old. And I'm so grateful because of all the times, this was a time we could have made a really radical jump in leadership and in how we work and organize. What were your observations as you've watched this evolve? You and I were talking long before this happened. Right. As you've watched this evolve, what have you seen? I'm sitting here in the middle of Silicon Valley, right? Five years ago, if you had thought about the fact that established tech companies were going to be the first ones to do downsizing versus the startups versus Main Street, you would have been very, very surprised that that's what would have happened. The reason was twofold. One, they overinvested in hiring people, but that's happened before and that's not the real cause. It's this understanding that the way we work is fundamentally changed now. We're no longer going to work in offices long-term 
And that's because people have come to understand themselves a little bit better, which is I don't like being disconnected in a work environment. I'd much rather be connected with my life, my colleagues, my friends, my ones at home. That change has fundamentally altered the work of the corporations. They're going to try to keep that old system, but that's just not going to happen. And I think that's what we're seeing with young people. They're not willing to give up those level of connections that they have with those around them in order to go work in an environment that is disconnected. That's the biggest shift. Which is ironic because if you listen to the whatever chatter, you hear that the, the young people are the most disconnected because they're on their phones all the time. It's a really intriguing twist to that story. It is. Well, the connection that we're talking about is one of most of us who have worked in corporate feel it. We walk through the door and we change. We become someone different. We now have to behave in a way that meets the norms of that environment. And it's not comfortable, it's stressful. Burnout is at an ever increasing rate. Disengagement is at an ever increasing rate. Both of those represent that disconnect that we have within an organizational setting. And there are organizations that do better for sure. But overall, there is that sense. And young people, for whatever reasons, are finding that they don't have to, they don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thankfully. We certainly did in our generation. I certainly did when I was younger. From the executive level, where sadly we recognize this is the bottleneck, that the executive level, I was reading just yesterday, about the way these systems are designed inside organizations, it's to keep the executive level at the what's in it for me place. They cannot get out of that box. It's just designed that way. The processes, the reward systems, everything are designed to keep it at what's in it for me. And this takes awareness to move out of that narrowly defined sense of purpose, you know, shareholder value or fill my pockets with more money through shareholder value, whatever the motivation is. Is there a lever <laughs> that give them some relief because that level of organizations under a huge amount of pressure and stress, people are breaking down, but not necessarily aware of, it's like a frog in the boiling pot thing. They're not necessarily aware of why there's that much pressure and stress and or how to shift it. I don't think that we can, to be frank with you, because I think the reason they are, the reason I was in that state was because I didn't realize that I was in an environment of force. The whole system is built up on force. What you've just described mm. is a system of force. We call it fiat, meaning that it's a dictatorial type of system. There isn't a single dictator. It's the system that's dictatorial. Yeah. And so we say, well, we've got investors. They get to dictate who the, what the executives do and what the board does. And the executives have to dictate what middle management does and so on and so forth, all the way down. And that process is about maintaining force in the system. When you release that force, then you've got chaos because you've got a system that isn't built on motivation. It's actually built on fear, right? What if I don't keep the thumb screws on tight enough? I'm going to lose control, mm. yeah. right? That whole view of the world as a system of force, and we don't think of it in those terms, but the reason we are so direct about how we describe it is that essentially we take force and make it and justify it as a way of incenting people. That's the way we think about it. We need to incent them, right? Yeah. So buy in. We, buy. My, as a facilitator, and this is 20 years, 30 years, every time I hear that, it would just drive me nuts. Yeah, exactly. Our job is to sell them on it. I'm starting to get to a point where I'm realizing that we're not going to be able to help those individuals change themselves because they can't see what they're dealing with. They're stuck in that world, a world of force. 
and they can't see it for what it is. If we can work with them to help them see that, that might be an opportunity. But for the most part, those individuals aren't willing to even have that conversation. It's too scary to let go in that way. Mm -hmm. It's really a bottom-up scenario. It's getting those young people to understand what it is that they're avoiding, what it is that they feel when it feels right, and what they feel when it feels wrong, understanding what that is. Because the feeling right is radical purpose at work. And what feels wrong is being put in an environment of force. And so understanding the mechanics of what's happening there gives us a better chance of creating the new types of organizations and new types of environments where people can work. It, it sounds very negative to say that we can't help them, but you've probably heard this before. Uh, the old theories die with the scientists. Old theories don't go away. They die with people who created them. And these systems aren't going to go away by themselves. We need new generations to adopt new systems to be able to displace the ones that are here. It seems to me that this is a parallel track because the alternative governance models that are coming forward, you know, emerging out of different experiments are the one layer, the layer of how can we do this differently in a way that respects people. As you say, design the system in a different way. Or my colleague Andrew would say, from a British point of view, change the rule set. So there's that dimension. And then there's the layer called leadership. Leadership has been deeply entangled to authority, as opposed to an intrinsic sense of who am I and what's my place and purpose in this world. It's a much more whole dimension of leadership, and it's a much more responsible level of leadership because you cannot move into these unstructured management systems, or not even call them management system. You can't, in, in these unstructured cooperative approaches without having a full focus on learning and expanding as you go. Having a full understanding of motivation. Because yeah. if you don't understand why you feel the way you do and why those around you feel the way they do, then you're working blind. Makes empathy right at the top. I've been looking at Antonio Damasio's Portuguese neuroscientist, as you know, having a Portuguese heritage, his explanation of why emotions matter. And yet, oddly and strangely, in corporations, they're the first things that you rub out, which of course creates all the burnout and the stress and everything else. As long as you ignore it, you just attract the worst. So there's that aspect of it as well. Exactly. And actually, Damasio's work is what we base most of our work on. It's so funny that you found him. His work is basically around understanding that at the root of human behavior is this asexual system, this system of feelings. And we can't even make logical decisions without affect. We thought the other way. The more logical you were, the less you needed your feelings or your emotions. But it's the opposite that fundamentally our system is based on affect. I love his example of one of his patients who lost the ability, the part of his brain that applies feelings to certain experiences, knowledges, and so on and so forth, and being able to make a decision. And he uses the example of asking him, would you like to go for lunch? He's capable of doing all of the logical analysis, but he couldn't make a decision where to go for lunch. He, wait around in circles for half an hour because he didn't have what Damasio calls an emotional lift to be able to actually say, it's this one that I want to go to because it just feels right. When you think about it, most of us will say, what do you feel like eating today? Right? And it's like, well, I feel like this, or I feel like that. Many of our decisions are done based on the emotional aspect or the felt aspect of what's going on. So that means that when we try to make things rigid and logical, that we're ignoring the fundamental part of who we are, the radical part of who we are. And so understanding that radical part is the essential aspect of understanding how we 
reorganize ourselves and as leaders, how we bring together people from a place of where they're at rather than we'd want them to be. We'd want them to be all cold and analytical and being able to do things. And we say things like, it's just business. Don't bring that into the workplace. Don't be emotional. All kinds of stuff. It's a complete 180. It's that other stuff that's important. The logical stuff can only work right if you're grounded in a good emotional state. Yep, yep. That makes perfect sense. It's meaning that matters in this context and what you care about matters. I'm hoping we're talking about a revival of care because that leads to connection, which leads to, it's just one of those beautiful cascading expressions. Exactly. Just said care. And you talk about connection. You talk about all kinds of things that we have historically understood that they're valuable, but not understood that they're essential. Mm. It's not that they're just good to have compassion, empathy, all of these things. These are good to haves. They aren't good to haves. They're essentials if we're going to be able to actually work together in a good collaborative way. We don't know how to work together in a collaborative way. Right. We know right. how to cooperate a little bit, but collaboration is about working together uh, around a shared purpose not simply cooperating sufficiently about what you want and what I want. There's a big gap between those two things. I'd like to explore radical purpose at the highest level possible because companies have traditionally had this really low aspiration to make money. And then around that is the next layer of, well, let's focus on one particular way to concentrate our efforts. In a world where a leader cannot hold two very different ideas, in one breath, I think we have a problem because we're working in a complex environment. Things are changing all the time. Individuals have to have enough self-awareness and enough resilience and self-efficacy and a whole bunch of related mastery traits to be able to do that. What does motivation have to do with the capacity to learn and to hold those opposing things simultaneously? Well, back to understanding motivation and force, right? So the two things that you've just described are force, which is the way we normally think. We think, oh, uh, here's how I'm going to get people to do things. Here's how my system is going to be built. Here's all of that stuff. And then there's this antimatter, if you will, of motivation and this intrinsic motivation, which is what we call radical purpose and the extrinsic motivation, which we've learned is really force in sheep's clothing. And so how do we hold both of those? That's the hard part. We need to allow for the ability to tap into radical purpose as a way of letting go of force. You can't do one without the other because then it's chaos. But by increasing one's individual understanding of their radical purpose and our collective radical purpose as a team, then we can start to reduce rather dramatically the use of force. Th that's the balancing game. You can't do one without the other, but you cannot keep force and grow intrinsic motivation. They're incompatible with one another. And so for us is an understanding that we have a purpose in ourselves that is to serve life. All of life has a purpose in itself, which is to serve life. Our own, the ones we care for, the things around us. Life itself has learned through evolution to care for itself. And when we put things in front of us that are antithetical to serving life, the only way we will do them is if there is a mechanism of force that will cause us to do them. Am I willing to work in an environment that hurts me, hurts my peers? No. Well, you will if I put this carrot in front of you, right? Or if I threaten to fire you, if you don't do the thing I want you to do. 
So those things are what has kept our system of work working, if you will. Mm -hmm. And in place. And in place. Yeah. And now people are feeling, and our environment is feeling, the outcome of that. The environment and us are in the same place. Most people think of the climate crisis as the biggest crisis. I think the disconnection crisis is as bigger and bigger. We are, as human beings, at the same level of this function as our climate is right now. Yeah, I agree. I agree fully. So how do we understand what radical purpose is? Because I've been naming this motivational understanding in rather generic terms. Essentially, from a scientific perspective, what we understand is that as organisms, the first motivation we have is to gain and maintain energy. Without it, yeah. our organism falls apart. We have nothing. Base so, survival. Base survival. So life itself, the maintenance of life. But once you have sufficient life abilities, life functions, the first thing you need to do is understand meaning. Because what's around me? How does it serve me? How does it serve my peers? What does it do? We cannot make sense of the world around us. We can't act. And that's the first step. And so much of what we see is people being asked to act without a sense of meaning, right? Just go do it because I said so. Yeah. And, yeah. and not understanding how that's connected to something else, to connect it to something else that generates that innate motivation of wanting to do something about it because you clearly understand the meaning of it. What is it that it offers me? And it moves on to impact, which is acting. And many of us are tied to this, whatever is meaningful is what we want to then act upon. That doesn't always apply, but most often applies and taking care of things, as you mentioned earlier, caring and nurturing and creativity and creating order. Those are all aspects of the impact dimension. And that in many people is what drives their belonging. It's the fact that they find peers that see the same meaning and want to make the same impact. When you're a teenager, for example, you have typically this change in outlook on life, right? You move away from focusing on the parents and moving out and looking at the world. And the people you want to hang out with are the people that have the same sense of meaning that you do. They love music, the same music you do. They love certain aspects of the world that you do. And they want to make similar impacts in that space of meaning that they uh, identify with. The fourth dimension of belonging is not only about bringing us together as a community, but finding ways to emulate one another, to support and learn from one another in that way. And it's a, a very complex, but very interesting part of our motivational system, which is we really only learn from each other. We model one another. Finding the people that we want to model is a critical part of being able to do that in an organization. Go work with those people. But those aren't the people that I want to model. I don't care. Go work with those people. Right. If you're lucky in your department, you might find someone that matches. If not, then you're in a stressful environment because you're not connected with anyone. You don't feel you belong. We're destroying the motivational aspect. So I'm working in an environment where I don't have the meaning. I'm doing the things that I don't feel I'm impacting what I need to impact. And I'm not working with people who I belong with. And so right away, we've got people whose motivational systems are actually going against everything that they're trying to do by force. I was reading a couple of days ago, something about what humans do that AI can't. Empathy, humility, caring, and there was a fourth one. If you look at companies and how they're evolving and management design or organizational design, how do 
we work with these new technologies and the human factor in a way that it complements as opposed to dominates, because I see that business of force coming in again, where, exactly. oh, here we have this tech and it's going to look after your jobs for you. And you've already signed up perhaps to an organization and said, here, you're going to give me my retirement funds when I grow up. And yet here we are in a place where technology's got some interruptions. If, if a pandemic didn't interrupt thinking enough, then tech certainly can. How do you see that lovely dance happening? Well, uh, it terrifies me to think that we will introduce AI inside a system of force, because then what we are going to do is create AI that is also applying force. That's just the way it is, right? And because the people inside it don't see it for what it is, they believe, as did I, that's the way the world works, right? We did things that we innately knew were wrong. And yet we thought, well, that's the way it is. And I'm just weak if I'm not feeling good about doing this thing. I'm just not strong enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not all of these things. The system teaches us that we should feel guilty for not being able to do the things that the system wants us to do without having stress, without having emotional setbacks, without all of those things. Imagine that compounded by the type of technology that's emerging with the same mindset, with the same lens on the world. That to me is terrifying. The only way that I've been able to understand how this might work is that we very, very quickly, and I think it's very possible, change the way we see organizations from a standpoint of where an organization is the thing that dictates what those people within that organization are going to do, i.e. a fiat organization full of force to a group of individuals who through their own motivational and collaborative abilities are the ones that dictate what the organization as a tool will be for them flipping the organization on its head not just simply changing the structure of the organization as far as the management structure and the organizational structure but actually making the organization a tool of people rather than people, a tool of the organization. And that is a fundamental shift. I think it's a shift that we can do. Then employing technology in that way, I see that as much more viable in the way that takes us forward towards solving a lot of the problems we have. Otherwise, we're just going to become even bigger prisoners of a much more efficient system of force. And that's a really short-term end game. Not only is it going to be detrimental to humanity, it will be very detrimental to life uh, on earth. That I think is the biggest problem because the world of force is tied to winning and winning is tied not to life, but these abstract ideas of money and power not life itself. Hmm. We've got to reconnect with the fundamental reality of why we live. We don't live for money. We don't live to build a brand. We live to serve life. And when we can do that and build a brand, then we've got the right motivation. But when it's the other way around, to build a brand by force, then we're actually hurting ourselves. And as we know, the rest of nature. Yeah. Now, this is something that bothers me a lot. My original mission in the world was when I made the big shift out of running like crazy, being a single parent running a consulting business, which is, by the way, a sport for the mentally insane. When I made that shift, the bigger mission was how do we connect our decisions back to caring about the planet? 
and the life support systems that look after us every day. I've got tired of hearing, oh, well, that's externalities. They got dismissed, and yet you people would turn on the water and expect clean water to come out unless they were where you had to walk two miles to get not clean water. So there's these really interesting assumptions about what supports us in this world and why we need biodiversity and why we need to respect and make life-affirming decisions. Now, I've noticed that we've spent a lot of time exploiting and destroying as a species, we've got that really down. I would like to see us pivot and try something more creative and constructive and co-creative as an option. If you look at motivation as a powerful fuel for transcendence, what motivation will it take for us to make that switch from destruction into regeneration and or restoration of vitality? I'm not sure if you're going to show this video at some point, but I'm going to put on my little lens of difference here. So this is how we see the world. We see the world through this lens of force. The type of motivation that we actually have is not something we need that we don't have. It's just that we don't tap it. And they're there all along. We have a lens that allows us to see the motivation we have already. We don't need a new kind of motivation. We don't need to introduce anything new. We just need to remove the force that's blinding us mm. from seeing what's already there. We feel it every day. All the tensions that we have about not wanting to destroy things, not wanting to hurt people, walking by someone on the street who's homeless and that pain of wanting to help, but knowing that I can't, that it's just not possible. It's just not doable. That's all force. It's force that's been placed in us. When we can see it for what it is, when we change our lens, then we actually get to the point where we're able to create things, not from a place of effort, but from a place of effortlessness. We keep thinking that this is an intellectual exercise, that this transformation that we are in the midst of is one of being smarter, having better designs and having better creativity and better blah, 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 blah. We just need to let go a little bit. Let's go, let go of force and let nature which is what we are, rebalance. We are so out of balance mm -hmm. that nature itself, the feelings that we have, the stress that we have, the dysfunction that we have, is recognition that the nature we are is out of balance with the rest of nature. And it knows how to rebalance. We don't need to make effort to do that. And so... This idea of this fundamental change in organizations isn't one of this Herculean effort of trying to figure it out. It's this simple measure of saying, identify force and see it for what it is and tap into your radical purpose. It's there. It's not that you have to create it or find it or do whatever. It's there. It's a very different way of thinking about it because we're so used to, again, from a force mentality, thinking that we have to be forceful to undo force. Awfully tempting, very tempting. Right, right. Yeah. Reality, the more force we use to try to transform the things we have by force, the longer force remains. It's physics. You apply force to something else, there's force coming back at you. Yeah, yeah. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, yeah. And so we need to realize that we can see the world through radical purpose, and we do, except that the way that we see that world then gets those blinders on and, and all we see is, well, the only way that person's going to do what I want them to do is if I force them. Then I'm going to go, well, I know I can't force them the way I used to force them with a whip and chains and all that other stuff. Let me try something else. Here's some stock options. Here's some free food 
gem. Uh, oh, a gem. Here's all these little, yeah, little baubles that we think are us being nice when in reality we're destroying radical motivation. We're destroying it by not allowing the things that people actually have as their real innate motivation be what motivates them, but motivate them by something else that's artificial. It's a longer conversation, obviously. <laughs> But it was a great start to it because what you described looking at things differently is what I would call a shift in perspective. It's how do we just flip from one way of seeing it to another? And it's not that hard to do because, but it is hard to do if you're busy defending your worldview or you're defending your sense of security as confined by what you believe to be true. There's a degree of openness in a leadership stance that is essential for navigating complexities and opportunities in order to move forward. One thing that AI has proven to us is that you can think, if that's the word that we'd want to use, as well as human beings by simply creating a prediction engine. And that's what AI is. And therefore, it leads us to believe that we're prediction engines. And when we are in a state where we cannot predict the outcome of an environment, the outcome of a behavior, the outcome of something we're about to do, that's what we call fear. It's not about looking at fear as this thing that we need to fight, but looking at fear as this thing that is telling us we cannot predict the outcome of the environment we're in. Why? Because it's an unsafe environment. Because we have no control over the environment. Because we cannot trust those in the environment that they are going to be getting our back. Because it's, again, an environment of force rather than an environment of connection. And so it's about rebuilding meaning our ability to make a difference, our ability to connect with people, our ability to become, which is the fifth aspect of radical purpose, our ability to become, to grow with the efforts that we do, not simply staying static. Motivation isn't something that is static. It's something that grows as we establish our comfort with something else, our ability to predict a certain layer. Then it's like, well, Let's try to predict that next layer and the next layer. And that's growth. It's our ability to predict the outcomes of greater and more sophisticated complexity. Yeah. Yeah. And when we can't, we see fear, we feel fear. And so mm -hmm. that understanding of fear to me is very empowering. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. I know for me, going back to radical purpose, in my journey of being a nomad for nine years, when all of my front end thinking was a little too far out in front for the world, sad but true, in the nine years I wandered, the experience of being in environments of uncertainty pretty much 100% of the time, if I didn't have a sense of purpose, if I lost sight of my personal sense of why I'm here, my meaning, if you will, I got lost. There's that, that expression that all those who wander are not lost. And I thought, wow, that rings true for me because right. I had this vision for what was possible in the world. If we bring it back down to a personal level, what is it that I truly believe is, well, even though it seems impossible, what is it that I can use as my beacon when things are so uncertain? That's the only thing that I've got left. For me, the recognition that as an aspect of life that I have the ability that all of life has, mm -hmm. and that ability is innate to me, what I feel as lack of confidence and fear and feeling lost and disconnected are states of temporary disengagement from life. Mm. <laughs> mm. If I can 
understand that in the moment. I can work to actual address, well, what is it? Oh, I can feel right now that I have a, a lack of a sense of meaning around what I'm doing. I have this connection from this thing of where I'm about to go. What's the becoming that I feel is, is that I'm connected with? When we as individuals start to understand ourselves at a radical purpose level, we start to be able to predict not only where things are going to happen, but how we're going to react. So we start to know ourselves in a way that gives us the ability to take the steps we need to take, knowing how those steps are going to come out. Not because we're intellectualizing this again, but because we've got the lens on ourselves that allows us to see this and become better predictors of our behavior. So most of the prediction we do is about out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. We're like, oh, if I do this, what happens? If I do that, what happens? Awesome, if, I, yeah. if I say this to this person, what will they do? Right. Mm. But we don't think about if I do this, what happens in here? Mm. Right. If I say this, what will happen to me? What will I feel? Understanding our internal world is actually the power to be able to not only manage my external context, but my internal context. All of this isn't an effortful exercise. It takes effort to come to touch it. But once you touch it, once you see it for what it is, you don't have to actually sit there and think, oh, every moment of the day, what am I doing? How am I thinking? How am I feeling? naturally happens as long as you give yourself that lens into your radical purpose. Mm. It's okay. not about a set of steps that you need to take every day, every moment of your day. That was my experience as well. It just pops in when it needs to. Exactly. exactly. It's like a little nudge. <laughs> hey, remember? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Jose, you've done some interesting work with taking the radical purpose and putting it into an app. Can you briefly chat about that and where people can get more information? Yeah, so we've created, it's a work in progress. All of this stuff is open source, development in the open. We call it the radical purpose profile. If you do a search for radical purpose profile, you'll find it. Radicalpurpose.org is the website as well. It's a little tool that we're working with organizations. We've done some 1500 different profiles already. It's a six minute little exercise. The tool helps you see that you have all of these dimensions to you. The assessment deals with 25 different aspects of our motivation. And it helps you see that your makeup is different than other people's makeup. And you can now point at what the things are and see, wow, I'm much more about creativity. Not that I'm much more creative, but that the functions, the life functions of creativity are in me. And given the opportunity, I will become motivated to create something new, right? And that's me. That happens to be me in this case. That tool is a work in progress. We've got it in English. Spanish and Portuguese now, and uh, looking to do it in German as well. It's free. It's growing as a tool to help people start to understand their radical purpose. Wonderful. Jose, I want to thank you very much for riffing with me today on this conversation. We could do this again, I know, and explore other different yeah, aspects. Yeah, very of it. much so. so. I suspect we will be doing that and preferably in Portugal. Meanwhile, it's the West Coast. Perfect. Thank yeah. you so much. I really appreciated this. This yeah, is a great wonderful. conversation. Thanks, Jose. In order to see the dynamic that Jose has been describing, the force dynamic, you'd have to be able to back way, way, way up to observe without any positive or negative, but just to observe what happens in organizations? What are the processes that are put in place intended to do? What's the dynamic? When a decision is made, what follows? And, and is anybody noticing? It's an opportunity to just observe 
in your own life, in your work life, in your personal life, where are the things that strongly influence what you do next? It, it, Winston Churchill said that first we design our spaces and then they shape us. But similarly, I've also heard the quote that first we design tech and then the tech shapes us. So there's a number of forces at play. I, I invite you to observe them without a judgment. I hope you enjoyed the program. If you'd like to sponsor the program, there's a link in the show notes. You can pop over and help with the production and uh, distribution. And, and of course, my weakest link, the marketing side of the equation. You'll find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and occasionally Twitter. Thanks for joining.